Welcome to Human Solutions, simplifying HR for people who love HR from AIM HR Solutions on True Story FM. I'm Pete Wright, and this week we're talking all about quiet quitting. Never heard of it? The term quiet quitting means different things to different people. Do a quick TikTok search, though, and you'll hear things like this. I recently learned about this term called quiet quitting, where you're not outright quitting your job, but you're quitting the idea of going above and beyond. You're still performing your duties, but you're no longer subscribing to the hustle culture mentality that work has to be our life. So is quiet quitting just an example of engaged workers setting reasonable boundaries or of an impending productivity crisis in your organization? This week, Terry Cook, Jen Moff, and Jillian Derby join me to lend their insights to this quiet quitting phenomenon. Oh, hi, everybody. Uh, is this, uh, it, we have the panel together, Jillian, Jen, Terry, is this an inter- a quiet quitting intervention? Are you all, are you all still giving your all at work? We Terry are. And I, uh, Terry and I have had a good conversation about this recently. We have uh, various points of view, which I think you'll appreciate, Pete. Uh, how did I do at the beginning? I, I, I chose a TikTok video, which is uh, uh, probably uh, not the most uh, robust, uh, rigorous source of research. How did we do on defining, on allowing TikTok to define what is quiet quitting? Who would like to take that one? Not it. I can. (laughs) (laughs) Just so everybody knows, they all put their fingers up to their nose with a not it motion. Okay, Uh, Terry, I'm calling on you. Yes. No, I think you are accurate. I've, I've read and heard the same thing. It's not a new term, but it's being brought back quite a bit now. Um, and, you know, people will call it not giving their all. Some people will call it um, just having a better work life balance that they may have become more aware of over the pandemic. Um, so quiet quitting, definitely not a new term, but maybe has been further defined recently. So how did this come about as a topic for our conversation? It feels like when we choose to talk about a subject on this podcast, it's likely because you're starting to hear more about it across the association. Jillian, is that fair? Yeah, it's something we've seen um, hearing from members. It's also something we've just seen trending on social media. And so when we have an HR group like this and a topic that's so closely related to employers comes up, we want to make sure we cover it so that we're, you know, providing information. And I also think that there's two sides to the coin of quiet quitting. There's the, I don't want to say old school mentality, but there's the mentality that you're not giving it a your all. And then there's also the mentality of, okay, we need to set some boundaries here. What's healthy. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think it depends on how you look at it. And I think the other thing is that, after COVID, you know, the lines really got blurred between home and work. And so we're almost starting over in a lot of regards, right? Like we're, we're in this new environment of being remote and it's like, okay, I can't always be putting out fires and working late. So people are just burnt out. Um, And I know Jen can speak more to the burnout piece of it, but I think there's just, it's out there and it's something that needs to be addressed and it can be defined in either of those ways. Then Jen, to you, this idea of using quiet quitting as a term to define taking more authority and agency in what I give to my workplace, uh, to my employer, um, is is that a fair assessment of what is going on here or is it just a, a way to, to say, I, I don't care anymore? The human brain loves to put things in boxes and loves to overly simplify to make sense of it, to understand the world. So they're probably... Well, that's why I took this complex (laughs) question and made it a binary answer. Uh, Yes or or no, for (laughs) just for you. It's either this or it's this. There's no in between, no gray area, (laughs) no middle ground. That's right. Not even a box. They're just two little cups. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. So I'm sure there are people that would stand fully in either camp that you just outlined. And then I'm sure there's people mm-hmm. that also look at it different ways. There's a uh, another TikTok I saw where somebody who identifies as Gen X said, this is nothing new. We called it coasting. <laughs> so there's different language yes. and um, the meaning behind language or semantics is 
changing and evolving all the time. So like Terry said, it, these things are not new, but for whatever reason, it's getting a lot of press. It's getting a lot of publicity. And I think it's, it's very easy for us to say it's, you know, one or the other and that, you know, it, people want to understand it. And those are pretty easy to understand reasons for things. I uh, I love this topic because just as it, it landed on our schedule, I read this article about Google and uh, Sundar Pichai, CEO, steps up in an all hands meeting and says there are real concerns that our productivity as a whole is not where it needs to be for the headcount we have. He's asking employees to help, quote, create a culture that is more mission focused, more focused on our products, more customer focused. We should think about how we can minimize distractions and really raise the bar on both product activity excellence and productivity. And I read this and all I thought was this is a post-pandemic quiet quitting panic. Mm. This is 148,000 people being faced with exactly what you all just just spoke of, this idea of having been at home and realizing what we have given up in at the at, at the for the sake of our jobs and asking ourselves the question, was it worth it? Has it been worth it all along? And that leads us to this this real issue. How do we as HR professionals handle, navigate this uh, the, the sea of uncertainty that comes with this particular wave of quiet quitting of uh, of people who are asking themselves that question? Should you know, should I be giving my all at work right now? Uh, so how, what do HR managers do to keep their finger on this? Yeah, I think a lot of it now is really relating to people. So we all know we went through a hard time. Human resources professionals know that just as well as anybody else, because they were trying to navigate things for the company, but also for the employees at the same time. And I think a part of what I'm hearing is is that employees just really want to be heard and they want to know that they're understood and that Mm. they're there are some areas of blurring that can happen, as Jillian and Jen have mentioned, in the whole home life versus work life. So I think what I've been reading as well lately is that a lot of people really put a lot of emphasis on how they're respected and treated and heard at work, even more so now than maybe they had realized they were doing before. So they may have just been kind of like operating day to day. And then as this mm-hmm. change happened with the pandemic, just realize the value of some of that balance that they could have. And they want to know that the company respects that balance and that they understand where they're coming from. Um, So I think that's part of it, Pete. Um, I think it's just a lot more of style management. Um, There's been a lot of things I've read about that that said, you know, people want to be related to. They want, they don't want you to just give them an assignment. They want to know, they want you to know who they are. And then also Mm -hmm. be able to say, you know what, you have a family, you have a personal life, you have this going on outside of work. I know that I want you to have that. And I value you as an employee during your hours of employment with us. So we've talked a lot of uh, uh, about burnout uh, over the last couple of episodes and mindfulness and, and, you know, ways to keep your sanity at work, particularly when you are challenged and stressed with all of the, you know, heat gestures, broadly <laughs> things that we're dealing with right now. Um, so Jen, you know, because you and I have been talking recently about some yes. of these issues, how do you pivot some of what we've been talking about uh, around preventing burnout into this, this quiet quitting discussion? Is there, a, is there a tidy box you can put that in? <laughs> I, as it so happens, I have one right here. I just opened the lid and we'll find some things inside. A Marcel Marcel (laughs) moment here on the Human Solutions Um, Podcast. So I I think about this a lot because nothing exists in a vacuum. And quite frankly, I don't believe that the pandemic is the main instigator of this. I believe this was happening prior to a pandemic um, coming upon the world. That was maybe a catalyst to accelerate the conversation. Um, probably in the last decade, I think we've all noticed just a slow crescendo in change in values and how people live their lives and work and what matters to them. You can see that even in the advancement of like conscious capitalism and conscious consumerism. 
not new terms, not terms that evolved from the pandemic. They were there before that. So people want different things. Different generations have different values. We run trainings and discuss how each generation has their own unique makeup and values. So as new people come into the workforce, we have to pay attention to what they desire and what they need and not look at people as, you know, oh, this is my pen. I use my pen. My pen is here to do a specific job. And if it's not doing exactly what I want, when I want, how I want, I'm just going to throw it away. And perhaps people have felt that way. They have felt like I'm just, mm-hmm. I'm just a cog in a machine and they want more. And that's okay. We, we can change what we want. We can change our values, what we believe and our attitude towards work. And the companies that are really thriving in the marketplace that are growing, that are sustainable, are listening to those wants and needs. They are asking their employees questions. They aren't turning a blind eye. And that's really what it takes, I think, as we continue to evolve. I, I listen to that and I think, of, of course, the the reason we're talking about it now is immediately post-pandemic when organizations, you know, rightly struggled mm-hmm. over closures for years trying to figure out how to marshal the limited resources they had to actually get them to come into work and do things to so that we don't lose everything yeah. we've worked for. So it, it that doesn't come without some level of understanding about where we are right now. But it does allow us to pivot into the other side of this conversation. Uh, Jillian, what is quiet firing? Quiet firing is something that's come um, up that's the opposite of quiet quitting. Um, it's, so it's when the employer or the manager is deliberately offering only a minimum wage and benefits in hopes that that unwanted employee would quit. This whole idea of quiet quitting and setting boundaries to me is uncomfortable because I feel like I always need to people mm-hmm. please. And that's just in my nature. So I wouldn't go down this path, but I could see how somebody who has anxiety or somebody who is an employee could think that maybe their manager has it out for them. Mm -hmm. And I think that why it's so important to go back to Jen's point and Terry's point of this healthy dynamic and open dialogue between a manager and their employee, because I don't run into that situation anymore. I have a great manager of my relationship with my manager and I'm able to never feel that way because I know what her intentions are. We have good communication. Um, But there are companies out there that are doing this quiet firing and they're doing it in retaliation to maybe some employees who are, you know, setting boundaries. Oh, I I absolutely, Jillian, can remember a time where that happened to me. It was definitely in the like restaurant industry, that was very commonplace. Oh, we'll just reduce your hours. We'll just, you know, eventually like phase you out. We'll never have to say anything. You just won't have any time on the schedule. Like, so even that, it's not a new concept, which I think is really fascinating too. Terry, please tell me that there are issues when employees report that they've been quiet fired. Please tell me that <laughs> Massachusetts has some statute that they can call on. Uh, You know, I have this feeling if you and uh, your dynamic duo, Tom, were on this show, you would you guys would have something to say to help me rationalize why that's a horrible, horrible way to manage. It definitely is a horrible way to manage for a few reasons. First, Pete, yes, it's called wrongful termination. Is is the is the legal <laughs> Thank <piece> you. <laughs> that that yes. people can file. Um, but honestly, in this labor market, what you're gonna start hearing and seeing more of is that the quiet firing is probably not the right way to do things because then you have to replace that person. So, you know, the better yeah. avenue to your point is to really have conversations and just talk about you know, what it is that might be wrong. There's people out there, I choose to believe this wholeheartedly, always have, that, you know, there's people out there that may not even realize they're doing something that's wrong or that's upsetting to the employer or isn't as productive as they need to be. They they are maybe those people out there that just need to have a conversation with you and then you could see a change. I've seen it happen over and Mm -hmm. over again in my human resources career. It's like, um, a supervisor will come to me and say, oh, this person's always been like this. They'll never get it. I think they're going to have to leave. I have a conversation with them and they're looking at me like I have 10 heads, like no one's ever said a word to me before. 
I always thought I was doing a good job. So what is the problem? And then we sit down and itemize it. And I've seen people turn around like a, do a whole 180. They just didn't know, honestly, what they needed to do differently. And once they did, they did it. And, it, you know, Jillian mentioned, you know, some people are people pleasers. And there's definitely those people out there. But that those are the people that if they're a people pleaser, they want to change. They want to make things right. Mm-hmm. You know, but supervisors or managers that take the stance of, I don't want to deal with conflict. So I'd rather just sit back and and see if this person will just kind of go away because I'd rather that than have a difficult conversation. That's the problem. Oh, a thing I want to piggyback off of what you said with the people pleasing. Another thing that I've seen, not not recently, but I have seen it in my career, a manager will exploit that people pleasing and then cause that person to overwork, overgive and lead them to this place of burnout. And so again, it's that communication piece. It's that manager employee relationship that can also be a by not a byproduct, but um, a result uh, that leads to quiet quitting as it were. <laughs> yeah, it, it's really a, this sort of commensalist relationship. Like the 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 manager, the, the employer-employee relationship is, it, it has to be, uh, it has to work together. Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, quiet quitting represents, on, on one hand, I think something very positive, which is, again, taking agency and authority in your own mm-hmm. career. But on the other hand, it's sort of abdicating responsibility to have a partnership with your manager that says, you know, here there is a line that I need to draw, but I still want to do good work here. And that's, I, you know, that's sort of what I'm hearing you all reflect, that this partnership is really important and it absolutely goes both ways. And there is no reason to start casting blame. I think quiet quitting, using it as a badge of honor, what I'm hearing is that's a that's sort of a blame term, right? It's it's blaming poor performance on and poor productivity on, you know, people who aren't giving it their all. And maybe they just don't understand one another. Right. So how then, as we kind of wrap up, how do you maintain and, and create a culture that celebrates this sort of psychological safety for everybody, right? For the HR managers, for the man- employees and employer. I think from a training and professional development perspective, you have to invest in your people to have the skills to be able to do that, to have to have meaningful relationships. And I, I was doing an effective communication training the other day and I made a little joke. I was like, you know, we all... We all talk, so we all think we know what communication is, but there, I have a degree in it. There's so many classes about theories and models and just the structure of what effective communication actually is that we are not actively taught. It's not part of, you know, parental caregiver teachings to their uh, family members. It's not part of school. So we have to see the value in learning and development of our staff, of our leadership. And it does, it rolls downhill. So we have to, you know, lead through example. We have to advocate for ourselves, those of us in leadership positions and say, hey, I want to develop myself. I want to be able to, you know, be self-aware, know what my, my, my pros and cons, positives and challenges are so that I can work on them and model that it's okay to do that. Um, We have to continue offering and prioritizing that on an annual basis. It's not just like a, okay, well, we took this thing and now it's all done. Like development of of any type, personal, professional, spiritual, what what have you, it's it's a commitment to self. And we have to em- embody that through how we show up at work every day. Uh, so you come in to work uh, one day and you're an HR manager and you start to have the inkling that you have some issues. You're hearing complaints from managers. You feel like there you might have a quiet quitting problem uh, on your hands. Is is that how it works? Is it is it? Are you seeing it as kind of a uh, endemic in an organization, or uh, do you? Is it isolated? Is is it contagious? I guess is the question. Mm. What is the hotline telling you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think if it's if it's a situation that's not handled. It certainly could be spreading throughout the organization. But I think a lot of times it's exactly what Jen's talking about in the communication. And I think it's communication not only between the employee and their manager, but the upper management and the culture of the company and the overall respect of e- of each other 
as employees and, and people. You know, I think that's sometimes the line that gets cr- blurred is people don't realize that employees want to be treated like people. I think even more nowadays, you you know, the style, the the approach of your managers, it can very quickly spread the wrong way, as you're saying, Pete. You know, Jillian mentioned, we have a, a terrific manager. You know, she has uh, mm-hmm. open door, open communication, shows a high level of respect, which she gets both ways because of that. And I think when you mm-hmm. do see that in the workplace, that's when you get to see the differences. And I do think when you ask about something being contagious. I think if somebody might see a manager treat one employee one way, everybody talks, everybody sees it, and then they're all of a sudden going to be on the lookout and be over, oh, maybe oversensitive to looking for that being the way they're being treated right now. And then that'll spread quickly through a department. And, and to your point, maybe it spreads further than that. So I definitely have seen hotline calls where an HR person calls in and said, oh, I know Pete can be kind of like that as a manager you know he's difficult with his people you know we really we had to lean in on <laughs> it's another on Pete. I, another I, Pete. I, it's a whole absolutely popular you, name. <laughs> thought, i just thought we had a different relationship as well that's okay you could go on yeah so so the other Pete, um that is difficult <laughs> you know i think when you when you let that go it is a problem you know i mean and they'll say that yeah. they'll be like yeah. oh yeah that's always been the problem but, you know, Jen came in and actually brought that to light now because Jen's not afraid to communicate and talk about it. And she's actually speaking what other people in the department have probably been feeling and thinking for years. So there's not it's not a mm-hmm. bad thing that those things come to HR's attention or to somebody's mm-hmm. attention, because in, in essence, it could, you know, fix a lot of the workplace going forward and make it a place where people want to be. People want to please their their company. They want everybody to succeed together because they feel that coming in the opposite direction too. There's also something to be said by leading, for example. So if you're a manager and you're answering emails late at night and you're always st- high stress, you know that goes on to your people. If I was getting emails from our manager at eight o'clock at night, nine o'clock at night, I'm the kind of person that's going to say, oh, I need to respond right now. This is important, right? Um, so mm-hmm. setting expectations that you don't need to reply at night or maybe having a delay. I know Outlook has that delay where you can send in the morning at nine during business hours. I think mm-hmm. that's important as well. Little things like that can make a difference. I love yeah. what you said there, Jillian, because I- I'm the newest member of the three of us that have been working with AMHR. And t- Terry and I had a fantastic conversation about this when we were prepping for this Um we're getting ready for you, Pete. We had a good convo <laughs> and I wish you could have been like a fly on the wall because there, there's obviously so much to talk about here. But uh, Terry and I yeah. have very different styles in how we show up at work and we respect each other so that it doesn't become this, well, Jen does not work as many, you know, <laughs> late nights or she's not putting in the extra blah, 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 or what, whatever it is, you know, we can point fingers and place blame on somebody else. Terry and I both believe in quality work. And so that shared value is what helps give us respect for each other because Mm. she has her own working style and I have mine. And it's easier to come into a role and establish boundaries than it is to make changes in the middle of your time there because it's like changing any nature of a relationship. People all of a sudden go, wait, Something is different, and I don't know how I feel about that. Change makes mm-hmm. me uncomfortable. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm very grateful to Terry, and I I know that we've been incredibly productive, even with maybe some other companies might look at the way that I operate, and I have very good boundaries with my day to prioritize my mental health, my emotional health, my self-care so that I can show up and do the best work I can when I'm here to do those things. Yeah. And I say mm-hmm. the same thing. Jen knows this. We've had that conversation where I'll say, you know what? When I took a vacation day, Jen, I took a lead from you and I actually took that day off and I just didn't respond. You know? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. That's right. Lessons learned. We do. Learned. We the learn from learned. each other every day. And just mm-hmm. so you know, on a final note, Pete, because I think you'll find this funny. One of my the members of my staff said there's plenty of T-shirts out there you can purchase on quiet quitting. So, oh, <laughs> Oh, outstanding. <laughs> merch for the merch store. Uh, 
we are going to have to get into Season that. Season three. I think. Watch well, this is, do, <laughs> anything you feel like we've missed as we wrap up? Jillian, did we cover everything you wanted to make sure was on the I list? I think so. Yeah, me too. This is a great conversation, y'all. Thank you so much uh, for hanging out and talking about this. Uh, and, you know, hey, if you're listening to this and you've got more questions, call the hotline. Uh, head over to aimhrsolutions.com uh, and uh, learn more about uh, AIM and uh, what AIM is able to do for you to help you learn a little bit more about quiet quitting and creating a balanced environment, a balanced atmosphere at your office. As always, you can find links and notes, all of that back at aimhrsolutions.com. Listen to the show right there on the website or subscribe in Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you get fine podcasts. Thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to this show. We appreciate your time and your attention. On behalf of Terry Cook and Jen Moff and Jillian Derby, the whole crew, I'm Pete Wright. I'll catch you back here next week on Human Solutions, simplifying HR for people who love HR.